Bicycles are a pretty handy way of getting around. They're lightweight, pretty narrow so they don't take up much space, cheap, and run on whatever it is you've eaten for breakfast, making them ideal for short-distance transport. Monorails are also a nifty way of getting from A to B. However, with all their benefits, they do come with some downsides that makes a standard rail system more ideal in the long term. So, how do you improve a monorail? Well, some folks looked at bicycles and thought that they were the answer. <laughs> The first railroad to use a bicycle-style design was created by a man named Eben Moody Boynton in the 1890s. He felt that by making the locomotives taller and more narrow, he could effectively operate a double track in the same amount of space as a single, conventional railway. The locomotive he designed was driven by a single, six-foot driving wheel mounted under the boiler, with two more smaller wheels under the cab. The wheels were flanged on both sides to prevent them from slipping off the rails. Fifteen feet directly above the track was a wooden guide rail, with the locomotive having two sets of rubber wheels mounted on top of it set either side of the guide rail to keep it balanced upright. Hypothetically, it was believed the engine could travel at speeds of 100 miles an hour, though there doesn't seem to be any sort of record of its actual top speed. To compensate for how narrow the engine was, it was built much taller, with the cab alone having two levels. The passenger cars were also two stories tall, with each floor having nine seating compartments. All of the doors were connected by a rod at the top and bottom, with a lever mounted so that the brakeman could open and close all the doors simultaneously. To demonstrate the design, a wooden guide rail was built over an abandoned two-mile section of track between Gravesend and Coney Island, New York, and opened in 1890, with Boynton running services along the line. The design worked well, and as such, Boynton had three more locomotives built. Despite Boynton's bicycle railroad being cheaper and more compact than a regular railroad, he couldn't seem to sell his design, and as such, the railroad ended up closing a mere two years later. I can't find any official reasons for why the design wasn't picked up, but at a guess, it was likely due to the need for additional infrastructure and its lack of freight transportability. The height of the cars would have made stacking and loading goods awkward compared to a standard railroad car, and because of how narrow the cars were, this too would limit the kinds of freight that the train could carry. There do exist designs for a bicycle freight engine and goods wagons, however, it's uncertain if they were ever built. Given that most money earned by railroads at the time came from freight and not passengers, it made sense that most railroads wouldn't be interested in the design. In addition, an extra platform was needed set above the one at ground level to allow people to access the second-story seats of the carriage. This, combined with the overhead rail, was likely seen as more complexity for the same results as a standard, tried-and-tested rail system. This, however, wasn't the end for bicycle railroads, as later, in 1910, a monorail with a similar design was built for the Pelham Park and City Island Railway, between Bartow Station and Marshall's Corner in the Bronx to replace the horse-drawn service that ran it. The main difference between this one and Boynton's railroad was the overhead guide rail, which was closer to the ground and provided power to the rail car that ran along the line. The Flying Lady, as the car was known, was the only car to run on the line, and, rather unfortunately, derailed on its maiden voyage. Nobody was seriously hurt, and the cause of the accident was put down to the railbed sinking under the weight of the car, which was carrying 100 people at the time, instead of its normal capacity of 40. Because the railbed sank, the wheels on top of the car couldn't reach the guide rail, causing the car to lose balance and tip over. Despite this, the car and track were repaired and the line was reopened a few months later. The monorail only ran for three years, with the company running it going bankrupt just a year after it was opened. It was then taken over by the newly formed Pelham Park and City Island Railroad, who decided to replace the monorail with the standard gauge railway. Ironically, the company replaced the car with a horse-drawn tram for the first few months after its opening, before a battery-powered rail car took over. In the end, bicycle railroads did somewhat prove to be a plausible alternative to a standard railway system. However, for whatever reason, be it lack of interest, its need for more specialised infrastructure, or simply the other drawbacks of a monorail system compared to those of a normal railroad, these quirky little engines just didn't take off. Quite a shame, really, because one of these engines in streamlining pulling the 20th Century Limited certainly would have been a sight to behold. Subscribe for more.